Welcome to our podcast, Doing It Right. This podcast reveals authentic stories from successful leaders doing it right. It's about their journey to become a leader, their choices, motivations, and lessons. In essence, how they built successful personal brands. Your host is Valerie Sokolowski, author of eight leadership books and nationally known as an authority on executive presence and personal branding. Let's get started. Here's Valerie. Well, welcome back. Here we are again. You know, I've always felt that coaching, executive coaching that I do, is really about the head, the hands, and the heart. In other words, we have to have the head knowledge to be a coach. We certainly have to have the tools and the resources. But we also really have to come from a place in the heart. And so my guest today, Teresa Poole, is someone who really fully embraces that philosophy. She lives it every day. Teresa is what we call in the coaching industry an MCC. And what that means is a master certified coach. That's the highest certification from International Coach Federation, which is the largest, most prestigious coaching organization in the United States. Now, Teresa not only owns her own business called Transitions for Business, she's not only a coach, she's also a leadership training person, and she's even an instructor for other coaches, and she mentors, and she's an assessor at UTD, University of Texas at Dallas. Teresa is a woman that I have admired, and every time I tell her that, she kind of blushes <laughs> it's always sit, hard to sit here and listen to all this stuff. I about know, yourself. your wonderfulness. Like, you this part? <laughs> well, the good news is you don't all say it. I, I yes. say it. And so it's not bragging, it's the truth. Teresa really is a woman to be admired. And uh, she's a colleague in the coaching industry. But she lives her brand. And to me, I'll be curious to see if she agrees, but to me, one of the main attributes of Teresa is that she is a giver a real giver from the heart. In fact, she told me that um, she sees her role as giving back and planting seeds. There's another thing, Teresa, that I want to share with the audience before I turn this to you for a moment, and that is I loved what you told me about your mission, your mission statement maybe, whatever you want to call it. But here's what it is. To make, listen to this, I think this is just unbelievably wonderful. To make a positive and profound difference in 10,000 people's lives before the end of your life. So now let me really welcome you. Thanks so much for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Excited to be here. You know, it's it's great to have someone in the industry and to share different topics about it. But I'd like to start with all right, you are a giver, and I know that. How do you give back in the in the three areas of your work. You call it the three-legged stool. Tell us about that, how you give back in all three of those areas. Well, one of the areas, of course, is my work, right, Mm -hmm. as as an executive coach. And even though I've chosen the executive market, we're really coaching people, right? And we're coaching those three pieces that you talked about, the hands, the head, the heart. Mm -hmm. And I find that one of the best ways is to have that profound impact on people is helping them as leaders get in touch with their heart um, as part of their leadership. Is that hard? It's hard for them, Mm -hmm. right? It's hard for them because many times we think as leaders that we need to be hard driving and hard running and, you know, making things happen. Mm -hmm. And because in the midst of all that busyness, we tend to lose that attachment or connection that we have to our heart and our purpose Mm -hmm. and why we're really here. Um, Because we don't stop long enough to really listen to that quiet inner voice that right. can take our leadership into bigger heights. And, and can I uh, ask you about that one thing, and then I want you certainly to continue about the other two stool legs of the stool. But stay with me a moment on a leader and uh, the difficulty it is often with um, getting in touch with their heart. What would you have done with a leader who said to me once, well, I am uh, a very personal very private person and I don't want people to get to know me personally wow wow you know that's what I was thinking (laughs) 
We are all at choice of who we want to be in the workplace. Mm -hmm. I often find that leaders like that, when they achieve a lot of success, find that their authentic self sometimes gets hidden or lost. There's a reason why they don't want to share that. There's a risk that they're potentially, a protection that they're trying to create Mm -hmm. and helping them get in touch with what that is and finding out what the root of that is Mm -hmm. and whether or not there's a real positive intention there for them. Okay, good. I hope I did that for him. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Oh, a real story. (laughs) That's a real story. (laughs) So then uh, what about the other parts of you've got transitions in business. That's the name of your company. Right. What are the other two legs? Well, I also do a lot of really interesting work um, at UTD, right? And so after I had been coaching for a large number of years, I started working as an instructor and an assessor and a mentor, helping coaches, helping people develop into coaches so Mm -hmm. that they could go out and have that profound impact. So by having the impact on one student, you can then roll that out to have an impact on many others. And that has just been a fascinating journey to be part of that and to be part of the program. And uh, one of the cool things about coaching as a profession versus other professions, I think, Mm -hmm. is that the person that develops the most is the coach. And I'm sure you found that out to be true, right? We learn a lot. So we're not Mm -hmm. only having an impact that that they can have an impact on leaders or other executives. They're also having a huge impact on themselves. And they often report that at the end of the program that the biggest change has been not the change they do for others, but the change they've done for themselves. I think that's a nice nice thing to say, and it's very true. So tell us what you mean by an assessor. So an assessor is someone that listens at the very end of the program. Part of the final graduation requirement is to provide an oral exam that can be reviewed to mm-hmm. see if you are actually coaching at a specific level. That is how the ICF determines Um, efficacy for Mm -hmm. coaching Mm -hmm. by providing these three different levels um, for coaches to achieve and for coaches to graduate from our program they have to demonstrate that it wasn't just an academic exercise of getting through 11 months of training but they actually um, internalize that and we're able to take that and um, and utilize it in their coaching so that we get to hear it and experience it as assessors um, to make sure that they're ready to go. So you're really putting the feet to the fire. Right, before we send them out into the Mm. world. You know, when I, Teresa, when I went through the certification process myself, I said to my husband, this is like, you know, getting a Ph.D. Tell us what it really means to be a a certified, and particularly at your level, Uh the MCC. What does that really mean to the marketplace. To the marketplace. To the marketplace. So that if you are buying a coach yes. um, at anywhere in the world, mm-hmm. right? And so, you know, the ICF is the governing body for coaching worldwide mm-hmm. and a certifying body. And so if you are hiring a coach at a certain level, whether you are in Japan or China or Malaysia or the United States, that you know that that coach is coaching in a specific way. I mean, not a specific model necessarily, but specific level of competency. There, there um, Depending Mm -hmm. on what level that they're at and that companies can uh, depend on that. Right, so it's a safe zone for someone in a company to ask, and if you are a certified, ICF certified coach, they know they don't have to worry. They're not going to get egg on their face if they hire the wrong person. So what is the third stool or the third leg in your stool? (laughs) Well, that is newer, newer than like the last five years. Um, When I achieved my master certified coach level, I was like, well, what's next for me? You know, what what can I do now that will continue to create that place of stretch, right? Because I think it's important for all of us Mm -hmm. to always, you know, kind of have a passion right in front of us, have a stretch right in front of us. And... So I was, you know, at a lunch with some coach friends of mine going, well, I wonder what that's going to be. And one of my good friends, she said, well, what about this coaching with horses thing? That's new and unique, and it'd be a stretch. And I was just like, well, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I can't I have no background with horses. I just like, why in the world would I ever do something like that? Well, five years later, um, I I work on a regular basis with adults that are in uh, addiction recovery using horses as the coach, and I just facilitate the process. Now, wait a minute. I, I have to ask. So were you a horsewoman? 
I oh, mean, no, 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 no. I, oh? My only experience with horses, I was about 14 years old, and I was at a park, and a horse kind of decided it wanted to go back to the barn, <laughs> and, and I just hung on. And so that was my <laughs> one experience of riding before then. And so, yeah, so at 55, I decided that, wow, this horse thing could be interesting. And so I've been on that journey of both learning about horses. Um, I, I rode horses. I owned a couple of horses and so that I could really understand them. And that's when I started really realizing there is a lot more to a horse than what you can experience on their back, or you're the boss, is when you get on the level with them and you use the, the power that they have, the things that they've, de- the sensitivity they've developed as prey animals for millennia, and how that can be utilized in the coaching process. Okay, so I'm trying to visualize this because I haven't seen it. I've heard about it also. No, I have no desire to go do it. But what does it look like? Give me, an, give us a story of, of you walk in and there's a person. Right. And who is the person? Someone in mm-hmm. chronic pain, you said? Well, I ha- we have a couple different audiences we work with now. Okay. Um, we work with leaders. Um, we also, and that's very interesting because horses have a lot to teach about leadership. Um, Really? We we work with adults in addiction rehabilitation. So while they're in a 30-day live-in program, um, the organization that they're doing the live-in program with will send them out to us in small groups, and the horses will teach them about boundaries. Personal boundaries is often a challenge for those um, in addiction. Can you show show us, visualize, what that one piece, how do do you do that? (laughs) How do you do that? Oh, I and just stand there. The horse does all the so work. So you're not on the horse. Oh, no, not at no. all. They are in They are in a small uh, arena, almost the size of this room here, a little bit large, maybe twice as large as this room. Okay. And they are with the horse. and uh, they're one, on person, the, one, one person, one person, one horse. One person, one horse. Okay. And the horse, because they have you know years of being prey animals, are incredibly sensitive. Um, we always say they will know if the mountain lion is hungry or thirsty as it comes down to the water hole. And if it's thirsty, they oh, will, oh. The, the lion can walk among them. But if it's hungry, they all run. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> and so the horse will know if the person has a challenge with boundaries or connection. Those two things are interrelated, different parts of the scale. And so if a, ch- a person has boundary challenges, the horse mm. will go up and kind of push their boundaries a little bit. And if the person tries to set boundaries but they don't mean it in their heart, if they don't mean it in their gut, the horse will go <laughs> and <laughs> literally, <laughs> literally in its own way, yes, the in, horse its own way. in their own way. Um, and, the, and if a person has a challenge with connection, then the horse will show them, well, you don't want me to be connected, so I'll just turn around and go the other way. So th- that is just one example of the way that the horses do that. And we also work with horses with adults in chronic pain. And that has been new that, and that's fascinating work because the horses will sense where their pain is. Really? And if a person places their hand on the horse where they feel pain, mm-hmm. the horse will literally react and release and respond to that. Um, they will sometimes shake or yawn or lick and chew or go over and roll. And then interesting, this, this is the fascinating part to Teresa, is that the person will feel less pain, not just there in that moment, but they'll come back two weeks later, a month later and report that they feel differently. Um, so we're exploring that Gracious. as a new, it's, it's like a new frontier mm-hmm. for us in the work that horses can do. Many people have heard about the work with, with horses and veterans. You're seeing that yes. in the news and in the true. paper, mm-hmm. and that's just one area. Horses, that children that have um, uh, you know, physical handicaps, and they will put those children on the horses and walk them very slowly and how that really can help those children heal as well. And so, but this whole area of chronic pain and working with addiction and things like that, there are just so many possibilities. So it takes my work that I do as an executive coach, which is kind of head-based and, and all of that, and gives it this very interesting and fascinating outlet because I have to say these horses are much better coaches than I will ever think to be and can get the work done a lot faster um, than are it would they, take me. Are they ICF credited? Wait, I have maybe you know, maybe that is a new place for us to go. Not yet. But are they trained in some way? Not really. Just any old horse. Well, we want horses obviously that are safe with people, right? Mm-hmm. The, the horses that are used to being worked with by a variety of people. No horse is truly bomb proof, but we do our best to make sure that horses are at least somewhere in that vicinity of be, you know being safe to work with. And but beyond that, the training they have again is that millennia mm. of of uh, evolution of being a, a prey animal and having to be incredibly sensitive. And we as human beings have many of these same senses. 
But because we are so busy, we stop listening to our inner story, to our inner heart, to our inner wisdom Hmm. that horses, because they don't have much of a prefrontal cortex, and because of that, they don't have all the stories running around in their head, all the judgments that we do. Mm-hmm. They Should, don't hang, you know, hang on to. And so they'll get into a little scuffle and a fight with each other, and they'll go back to grazing next to each other two minutes later. And not, you know, we won't do that, right? We'll hang on to that for months or for years. Months. We have a yeah, <laughs> yeah. different brain. Right. So horses have a lot to mm. teach us in that respect as well. And so that's why I was fascinated by what I they can bet. bring to the table. I bet. So it's a lot of fun. Is there, is there, maybe out of five years Teresa is there one um, crucible moment that just really was over the top joyful from that work wow only one well share as many as we have time for (laughs) it's narrowing it down um okay so we've we've had a gentleman when we have a one of our programs uh, for the adults in addiction rehab is called Empathy and compassion. Empathy, empathy com- and compassion. And compassion. And this is where they, you know, they have a series of programs they come and do with us. But mm-hmm. empathy and compassion is the one where they're giving back to the horses by doing a version of soft touch massage, right? Oh. Where you're just sending compassion and gratitude to the horse and thanking them for the lessons they've been teaching you in these other programs, right? And we had a gentleman that had to step away in tears because he said, You know, I felt for the first time this cycle of love, that when I give love, I receive love. So that was huge. Um, We've had, uh, you know, especially women in addiction often come from very difficult backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And personal power and boundaries is often missing for them. And this is true of men, too, but we see it a lot with with our women. And so for them to take a horse and request that horse, a strong request to please run around the arena in a circle and, and then change direction. So they're telling a 1,300-pound animal what to do. They're, vi- they're verbally they're, saying They're that. verbally and using body. Well, horses don't understand much language. You right. know, they hardly know their names. But when you use certain body language, right, you point in a certain direction. You may use um, an implement that we have that kind of is the engine to tell the horse to move. So we're giving signals. We're giving visual okay. signals for the horse to move. But if you don't mean it, you don't mean it, the Mm. horses won't do it. So you have to feel power in order for the horse to feel your power. And so for these women for the first time to feel their power and be able to make that happen is huge for them because it's immediate feedback. Now we can coach verbally, as you and I, Valerie, we know we can do that all day long with people and they'll have aha moments and they will eventually get there. But to see this mirrored this way so quickly, Hmm. Um, and we also see, you know, we get some leaders out there, men that, um, and women both, that are leading with a lot of power, a lot of power, you know, and they they throw a little bit of that power at the horse, and it is screaming around the arena going, whoa, and they learn to dial it down. And so they learn how to adapt and adjust their leadership so that uh, they, you know, and then they realize, wow, I've been doing this to my team. Right? I've been doing this to my people. And that look in that horse's eye, I think I've seen that. <laughs> my goodness, Teresa. And I'll share one more. Right? Yes. This is a chronic pain story. Mm. Um, a young woman that we, we have them get in touch in their body with their pain um, before they go into the arena with the horse just so that they, because pain can become so incredibly generalized mm-hmm. that this helps them kind of identify maybe a single source or a single point that they can you know, focus on and release when they go in with the horse. Mm -hmm. And as soon as she shut her eyes and got a touch with her pain, the horse starts screaming around the arena, jumping and leaping and throwing, you know, throwing dirt and, I mean, just whinnying. And, you know, the horse was agitated. And when she opens her eyes, she says, that's exactly how I feel. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those are all very different experiences, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. All, and so each person leaves with something that is so incredibly unique to them. Wow, I'm going to come out and see it if I can do that. Mm. That's 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 amazing. So, in in your background, um, have you ever had something that was really challenging that you've had to overcome? Oh my, only one. <laughs> Here we go again. <laughs> we we go need again. an hour show today. <laughs> 
Uh, um, well, I'll, I'll give you one very specific example that actually taught me to listen to my heart. Mm. And so my husband and I, I, I have always had a passion since I was 12. I wanted to raise, I wanted to train guide dogs. But back in the day, at you know, my tender age then, women couldn't be guide dog trainers. And so when I wrote the guide dog school saying, I want to be a guide dog trainer, sorry, women can't do that. And you want, it, this was from 12. This was 12. I knew, I knew at 12 I wanted to be a guide dog guide trainer. Dog I don't trainer. know where that came from, but that's what I wanted. I mm. really wanted to do that. But because that was the industry did not allow that in those days, uh, back in the day, um, so it never happened. But then when I became an adult and I was working at EDS at the time, and um, I saw an article of someone else there, you know, raising a guide dog puppy, I went, I'm going to do that. And so I, my husband and I, started raising you know, guide dog puppies. And at some point, I was asked to put a puppy program in the women's prison over in Fort Worth. Oh, and wow. I did. I did not want to. I thought, well. It's like the horses. Well, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> it felt exactly the same way. And I don't have no idea how to do something like that. It sounds incredibly hard. Why would I want to go to prison? Why would I want to drive to Fort Worth to do this? Uh, no, no, it was a big, huge no. It was the same no that I gave 20 years, 10, 15 years later when I started to do the horse thing, right? Same oh. no, same flavor. And the more I tried to, m eventually, when the message keeps banging you on the head, you eventually say, this is what I'm supposed to do. Hmm. I, you know, I believe that, you know, my higher power did not allow me to say no. And I became so uncomfortable that I finally said yes. Hmm. The more I tried to make it work, the less it worked. And the more I sat back and allowed it to work, oh. it worked. Say and that again. I think the that's more I tried to make it work, yeah. the more it didn't work. Hmm the more effortful it became, mm -hmm. and the more I sat back. Now, I didn't mean to sit back and do nothing, mm -hmm. but then you go, okay, what is supposed to happen? And just stop and listen to what is supposed to happen. Then it all started to fall in place. It was still work, but it was the right work. And then there was a time in which I knew it was done. Mm -hmm. and The I guide dog. I knew it was done, and I didn't want it to be done. <laughs> and then it became hard going what is this right it became hard and so I finally said okay I'm supposed to let it go this same thing occurred with the horses now I told you my initial reaction right yes. it was the exact same no from the exact same place and I thought uh oh I've been there before so it didn't take me as long it didn't take me a year to finally say yes I said okay this is I'm supposed to do this so I think the hardest thing is sometimes it's not so much something that's physically hard or mentally hard it is the overcoming yourself Right. I think that's always the hardest thing for us is mm -hmm. overcoming ourselves and how we get in the way of that which we are meant to do, supposed to do. Mm. And we get so incredibly busy, like those leaders I talked busy, about. Yes. We get so busy that, w and sometimes we do that on purpose, right? That busyness blocks. On purpose? We, we get busy on purpose because it blocks those uncomfortable messages. Oh, that's sabotage ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Or protecting ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're protecting ourselves from stepping into something that may cause us to really change our life. Because, for example, you know, doing the horse stuff has really changed my life right? in ways that I didn't want, in mm -hmm. ways I didn't expect. But you have to sometimes just step back and allow things to happen. And then these amazing things start showing up. When you finally get pat over yourself, then what shows up is you know, where you're really supposed to be. Where you're really supposed to be. That's... Uh, that's well first of all it's something that's hard for me uh to understand because i'm trying to picture going out and mm -hmm. working with horses but i'm sure open to that but having said that i uh, i asked you to give us today at any point and i think you just hit on one a, a teachable point of view a, a piece of wisdom that you would love to share with us and so there was something around that, wasn't there, about uh, listening to, to your inner voice. What would you say about that, and how to do it? I think that listen to is that it. Listen to your inner voice. How would you say it? It is. It is. It's it's listening to what your inner wisdom has to tell you. And that requires us to be quiet. Mm. Right. Be quiet. When we are out efforting in the world, and that doesn't mean we stop we're working. It doesn't no. mean we stop striving. It's not mm -hmm. about just sitting back and letting life come to us. Mm -hmm. But we must take moments. Mm -hmm. We must take regular moments and listen to who we are. Not what the world wants us to be. Not what we think we're supposed to be. Not what others think we're supposed to be. 
but who we know we're supposed to be and listen to those. How do you do that? So you, you, what, I'm, what I'm getting from you is, Teresa, so I need to stop certain points of the day maybe or whatever. But really, tell me how to do that. Am I just sitting there <laughs> pondering or what? I think if you create space, it comes forth. And that we all do that differently, right? We all find our unique okay. space. Yeah. And so for some, you've heard about you know, meditation, mm-hmm. right? Medi- the journey of meditation is the ultimate being quiet and letting things come through. Um, so for some, it is you know, just stopping and taking a walk. You know, take a walk in nature. Take a walk by yourself. A lot of it is about being by yourself. Some people journal. Mm-hmm. Um, some will you know, turn off the radio in your car. It's amazing when you turn off your radio, what will come out in the numbness of driving. Or or stop your cell phone. Well, there's that. Yeah. Yes, because that, I think, has made it somewhat worse Mm -hmm. while making it better in other ways. Um, It has caused us to always be connected, and therefore we're not connected to ourselves because we're always connected to others Mm -hmm. instead of being connected to ourselves. So it's not that you need to, I mean, for some, it may just be, I want to stop and take a two-day retreat. For some, it's I want to take two minutes, you know, every hour. Everybody's going to do it differently, and it's okay. Mm -hmm. We want to watch ourselves when we are purposefully blocking our inner wisdom, pushing it away, and we know when we're doing it. Um, So if if we if we truly embrace that inner voice, we if you stop and you think, and I was to say, Valerie, when does your inner voice come out? Mm -hmm. You're going to tell me probably while I'm in the kitchen cooking. Seriously, Uh, right. That's when my mind is just on nothing but just right. enjoying something I really enjoy. Yes. You know, in the coaching industry, we're taught to come to each session. I hadn't thought about the connection here, but maybe there is, with a clean slate. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the most difficult things for me because I am a doer, yep. and I'm always on to the next thing, thinking about what I just did and what I need to do. And that one piece was absolutely a turning point for me mm-hmm. professionally and personally and so maybe that might be a tip for the audience to just take time to clean your mind cleanse it just right. clean slate wipe everything off and just let it be the whiteboard for a while I don't know and find your own whiteboard and fi- oh I like yeah. that find oh I like that whiteboard. find your own whiteboard like you found yours in cooking yep you know and if you if you take that whiteboard and you might write one thing on it mm-hmm. like you know Oh, I like that. Yeah. So what would your one thing be that you would write on your whiteboard, right? And so Mm -hmm. for me, at that point where I looked at the horse piece, which is my current passion, it was, what's next? Okay, what's next? And so that question on the whiteboard will be different for all of us. And the important thing is that we stop and ask it and create that whiteboard space for the answer to come out from the inside Mm -hmm. versus a plan. We jump to the plan so fast. Well, we do. And, you know, the other thing is <laughs> how often, at least, do I wake up in the middle of the night with some great idea, and I'd better write it down or it gets lost. But I think it's because at night the mind just kind of goes. So, okay, so let's go back s- to summarize the your uh, main points of wisdom. So one is to um, create space for yourself to listen to that inner voice. And along with that, find time to be quiet. And then you mentioned something about earlier, um, finding your passion and weaving it into your work. That's what you did, isn't it? Or life. Mm -hmm. For some people, their work is not their passion, and that's fine. Just weave it in somewhere. Mm-hmm. Because I and I think I told you this, bef- you know, previously when we were doing our pre-interview talk, right. that one of the one of the really interesting things that I've seen as a transition coach over the last fifteen years is how, if people don't follow their passion at some level, it can create some really interesting things at midlife, mm. and what we often label as the midlife crisis, and that inner voice oh, of passion that's okay. not listened to over and over can actually bubble up and create sabotage. You know, and we see these kind of what we call the midlife horror stories, which is often that part that says, it's my turn, Mm. and I'm going to take it because you haven't listened to me. And if you listen to it beforehand, those parts of you can work together instead of that part just saying, muscling the hardworking, successful part out of the way and going, it's my turn. Uh Um, So 
<laughs> My goodness, there's so much <laughs> wisdom. I'm going to have to have you back, Teresa. Well, you know, in, in closing, I just will say that, um, again, thank you for, thank you for being the, the uh, depth of an executive coach that you are. That's why you're successful. And uh, I will just ask you to please tell listeners if they want to know more about any of the things that you've mentioned, how can they get in touch with you? Certainly. So you can reach me at Transitions. That's Transitions, plural, transitionsforbusiness.com. And you can find out more about our horsework at Solace Equine Center. Solace, S-O-L-A-C-E, Solace. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Teresa, thank you so much for being with us today. This was just Welcome. awesome. I've learned. I always me. learn so much. I hope the listeners learn as much as I do every time. And thank you for listening. Be sure now that you, if you have any questions about today, and if you want to... Uh, receive my monthly and it's a quick newsletter quick reading valerie's voice newsletter you can email me at valerie at valerieandcompany.com in the meantime build your presence authentically right teresa oh awesome yes <laughs>